All right, well, welcome everyone to the CHEER 2021 panel session on information interaction and retrieval challenges uh, for cultural heritage. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that we're meeting on today. Uh, in my case, in Canberra, they are the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm Matt Adcock from the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial uh, Research Organisation. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about the GLAM sector, which is galleries, libraries, archives, museums, and some other similar institutions as well. Um, they're the custodians of vast collections of physical objects, uh, but at most only around 5% is ever directly accessible to the societies for whom the collections are kept. Uh, so the sector is a huge, uh, has a huge interest in digitizing collections and using digital tools to create new ways of accessing their collections. Uh, but they typically uh, face a, a range of novel issues. And many of these issues could be opportunities for this research community. So our aim in this panel is to explore some of the challenges of, of dealing with digital information relating to physical artifacts and how we interact with that information both online and when we're standing right next to the respective object in the gallery, for example. We have an amazing lineup on this panel for you today. We have Arul Baskaran from uh, the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences. Um, the digital engagement manager there. We have Kate Carruthers, Chief Data and Insights Officer uh, and Adjunct Senior Lecturer at University of New South Wales. We have Matthew Connell, uh, the uh, Director of Curatorial Collections and Exhibitions at the Powerhouse Museum. We have Amanda Dennett, who is Head of Digital Experience at the Australian War Memorial. Uh, we have Megan Lawrence, Manager of Digital Experience at the Australian Museum. And we have Pedro Santos, who's Head of Cultural Heritage Digi Digitization uh, at Fraunhofer IGD in Germany. Shortly, we'll, uh, we'll have each of these panelists take a few minutes to introduce themselves and touch on some of the perspectives um, they have around how physical collections can be opened up digitally. Um, and uh, just in case you're wondering why someone from Australia's science agency is, is moderating a panel, panel on cultural heritage, uh, well, there's a few reasons. Um, CSR itself houses a number, of uh, a number of the national biological collections, which include millions of insects, birds, fish, and other wildlife. Uh, and around a decade ago, we started to try and figure out some of the ways to digitize these specimens. And uh, we discovered we were facing many similar issues to those in the GLAM sector. We also have a digital research arm called Data61, uh, which contains my research group. And uh, we've worked on quite a range of projects aimed uh, within galleries and online, um, ranging from social media analytics through to augmented reality interfaces. Uh, now I plan to ask a few questions of the panelists, um, but we'd love for uh, your involvement and um, uh, your help in guiding the discussion for this session. So please feel free to submit questions at any time during the session. Um, you can do this by using the Zoom chat feature uh, at any time, or you can, um, you can put them in the everyone, or you can aim them directly at, at Paul Thomas, who's uh, listening in if you would like and uh, he'll be collating them. Uh, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. So uh, I'd like to start off by uh, inviting Pedro Santos to uh, say a few words. Okay, so uh, I guess you can hear me. I'll just share some slides maybe. So I'm Pedro Santos. I'm the head of uh, cultural heritage digitization at the Fraunhofer Institute for Computer Graphics. Fraunhofer Institutes are nonprofit research institutes 
uh, for applied research in Germany. We have 80 of them, a lot of them, and one of them is close to Frankfurt, that's ours. And my department does cultural heritage digitization. What you see on the screen is one of the, uh, one of the outcomes of our research. So we started 2013. And back then we had a huge European project in which we thought, uh, in which we saw the shortcomings of digitization. This was when Google started uh, the, the book projects and Microsoft started the book projects. And all of a sudden you had machines where you could place books inside and you would digitize them automatically. And then we thought, could we do the same for 3D? And of course, 3D is a bit different because it's a bit more complex. You have to capture the whole surface of an object. And when we started, there was just the usual structured light scanners on tripods and everything was very, very manual. And this was not the way to actually digitize large collections. And so we thought we might want to automate this process. Actually, we come from industrial applications. So of course, the idea was to go like maybe robots, something like that. But at the same time, to take care of the of the particularities of, of this field. And so what we saw was that the cultural heritage market would sooner or later need a turnkey solution for digitizing uh, large collections, because uh, in the end, what you want is repeatable high quality. You want it to be as simple as using a Xerox machine at the end of your corridor and be sure that you always get the same quality because one thing that is definitely lacking is standards in 3D. So we set our goal and went on with it. We started with a scanning pipeline, a conveyor belt system that was mobile, but it was two and a half tons of mobility. So we thought, could we maybe decrease the form factor and, and make it smaller for everybody and more portable? And as you see, and as you know, many institutions have now started digitization, many of them uh, also with the advent of, of uh, let's say, low cost scanning systems like hand scanners try to go and scan their own collections, but they always actually found themselves in a position where they had some shortcomings uh, with those approaches. And so uh, the 3D digitization experience and outcome, it requires a digitization preservation strategy. It takes a lot of time currently and is expensive. expensive. But as you can see, and especially with the pandemic ranging, the potential is immense because this is a way to actually reach out to everybody and concurrently work on objects, for instance, because original there's just one. But uh, and you would like to share it maybe with others at the same time to reach your conclusions. So we went out to actually develop a solution for this a uh, smaller form factor and we set us our three priorities and number one priority is safety by design so number one priority is that the objects must be safe at all times when we digitize them in 3d and we want to actually capture the shape and the appearance uh, of the object and we want the systems to be easy easy to use so as i said it should be push button systems that don't require technical experience or technical skills if possible but grant you the third objective which is repeatable high quality because we think that the first goal must be to achieve uh, scientific quality let's say that you can use the model for scientific research and then you can produce variants for all the other uh, applications that you have in mind, like actually having 3D models on the website, using it for merchandising, for whatever uh, reason, but the top priority must be that you want to have repeatable high quality for scientific purposes, because you want to be able to concurrently work on the 3D models at one point in time with the very same tools that you're used in the analog world, you want to put them into the virtual world. Uh, and actually compare objects in 3D on a website, measure them, do kinematic simulations, uh, stuff like that. What you see on your screen is actually uh, one of our systems. So it's currently a created solution and the robotic arm will unfold out of the one box. You have a glass turntable uh, in the other box. And the idea is that you have a fully automatic system that will self calibrate geometrically and according to color. What we did was to actually adapt the color standards from 2D, the ISO standards to 3D. And what we actually do is, is basically to uh, make 2D problems out of a 3D problem. So we go like into detail and we adapt uh, the, the standards from 2D to 3D, well knowing that there are not yet standards in 3D for color calibration. Uh, but this is what we set out to do. Uh, the lineup is very flexible, so it can start with a very simple solution, a desktop solution can go on so you can add a glass turntable to scan from below, and so you don't have to reposition the objects every time, or you can have customized solutions that go for turntables up to 1.5 tons of weight and up to two and a half meters of height with a lift kit for the robotic arms. The system itself is very mobile, so you see the desktop version now, and I hope the, the 
the the frame rate is more or less okay uh, I will probably send out a link to that material later on so the way it works is photogrammetry based first it goes far away we take silhouette cuts of the object of a super imposed super exposed image and out of those silhouette cuts in real time we can calculate a 3D preview model and based on that 3D preview model we do a dynamic uh, view planning for exactly this object. So what we actually solved here and what is the unique selling point is that we can scan arbitrary objects without prior knowledge on how they look like. And so once you have that 3D preview model we do a next best view planning for exactly this model. Uh, which features the optimum number of images with the right overlap between the images and the right focus distance to the surface. And so we can actually predict how the image from the next viewpoint will look like and which parts of that image will be sharp and which will be out of focus. And we only use the parts that are in focus. By now, we can also scan shiny objects, shiny surfaces, because we combine this with polarization. And of course, in that case, you can use less and less of each image, which means that, for instance, for golden objects, you might need five times the number of images that you need for a clay object. But the final result that you get will give you like around 10 micron resolution and look like this. So actually, we are now able to fully automatically scan objects. I won't promise you the blue out of the skies, so maybe this will work for 80 or 90% of the objects and some require manual post-processing. But actually this one is a good example and a very gracious material as well uh, of an object that can be scanned automatically. And actually what you see is also the automatically generated high resolution video of that OBJ, of that final object uh, model that we produced. And so I just go on to show you some examples. Now we have been dealing with more challenging surfaces like for instance, gold, brass, and the last thing we did was ivory, which is semi-translucent, which also is kind of a problem. And so this is just a short video uh, to show you some of the results that come out. Um, so there are sample objects from different museums. Uh, you see golden objects, you see bronze objects. Uh, and in the back, there is this ivory, uh, ivory piece with brass uh, basically around. So that's a golden object that's Celtic finds. And as I said, you can go down to 10 micron by now and get very high resolution. A very last example of this is this object. Actually, this was an exhibition of 400 Java gold objects from Indonesia. And they were very, very small, about two, three centimeters. And they were out of gold. So we had the two challenges and the museum actually wanted to place them on 70 inch auto stereoscopic displays. So visitors could actually see them larger than life in all the detail. And this was done fully automatic by now. So that's basically what we do. And we believe the future is in actually automating this process. So we have comparable high quality across collections. We'll get later to that in the question sections. And if you need more information, we have currently four of the systems out. We're commercializing them now with a company in cooperation with phase one, uh, which is a Danish high-end camera manufacturer. And for more information, so you can go on Cult Arm 3D. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next up, we have uh, Matthew Connell and Arul Baskaran from the uh, Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences. Thanks, Matt. I'm just going to share my screen here. And Matthew's going to kick us off. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Matthew Connell. Um, as was mentioned, I'm currently the Director of Curatorial Collections and Exhibitions, Curatorial Collections Exhibitions at the Powerhouse Museum, also known as the Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences, but I've been a curator here since 1991. In fact, I started as the Curator of Computing and Mathematics. <laughs> and very quickly, the Powerhouse Museum has existed in <clears throat> one form or another since 1880. Um, we are currently in the power station, the Ultimo power station in, in Ultimo, the old power station building, but people may have heard um, already that um, the museum was planned to move to Parramatta. Um, that's, uh, that uh, plan caused quite a lot of disruption. We were moving out of Ultimo to a new building in Parramatta with new storage to be built at our Castle Hill site. 
We've now retaining the Ultimo building as well as having a new building at Parramatta. Um, and we are getting a new building. Uh, there's the Parramatta building for you. And we have a new um, building to be built at our Castle Hill storage site where most of our 500,000 objects will then be stored. We currently have 300,000 objects in Ultimo and we are moving them out. Even though we're staying in the building, we're moving the collection store out, um, not the least because it's very full and it's um, sort of below sea level, which is not ideal for storage. Um, as part of that project, because we were doing the project, there was to be a digitization project. And we were going to take all of those objects. In fact, we are assessing all those objects um, and having them digitized. When we first thought about this program, we imagined that every one of our objects would go through a system uh, like Pedro just described. No such system existed when we started this. And like every project we've ever done to capture images of our collection, we've always had to go back to cut our cloth um, according to the resources that are available. So what we're doing is high resolution uh, photographs of all the objects in our collection and their parts, cleaning up all the data that we can around those objects and, um, and that program is well and truly underway. We have our sort of pipeline. That's a picture of the space there where we have a number of cycloramas and cameras and lighting stations. Uh, they're dealing with the standard size objects, but um, also we're dealing with, of course, very small objects and some very large objects. Uh, I have to say the, um, of course, the aim is to um, make our collection accessible. We probably have never had more than 3% of our collection available. And when I arrived here in 91, the other 97% of the collection was accessible to the curators, the registrars, and the conservators, and a handful of uh, enthusiasts and researchers who came along. And um, now we can make our collection much more available. And with these higher quality images, we're hoping that we'll have fewer um, requests to uh, take pictures and fewer requests to see the picture or the image from a different perspective or see the object from a different perspective, which is what we currently have with a, a range of different quality images from the various imaging projects that we've done over time here. Um, the, um, what I'd like to talk about before I finish, I guess, are the issues that I see as the main issues that, that we face. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking from a curatorial perspective here, um, and to a certain extent from the being the curator of computing and mathematics. Um, one of the issues, the Powerhouse Museum, uh, like I said, has 500 thousand objects collected since 1880. It's an object centered culture. And uh, we know how to deal with artifacts. Um, uh, and as the curator of computing and mathematics, I've been aware for a long time of the issue of uh, data and well, other things associated with some of those objects, particularly early computers that are not defined easily as objects. And now we have the issue of trying to collect material relating to design, science and technology and innovation that is in fact born digital. And um, while there are a number of solutions proposed and a number of projects underway and schemes to um, preserve digital artifacts, the problem is a technological problem. The solutions are technological and the problems don't quite go away. And there's a very significant difference and a very significant issue that we face here that when our artifacts start to degrade, we can notify our conservation department. And when they get around to it by, and fit it into their schedule, um, they can attend to whatever the 
issues might be, which is rarely um, complete deterioration. Uh, but even if an item suffers some corrosion or damage, it's still what it was when we acquired it. Uh, this isn't the case with digital material, of course, and it's more like um, they're more like animals at the zoo that um, they're either alive or they're dead, <clears throat> and we're not used to operating with that. I think there's more work to be done in that field to to actually solve it. I think the time scales that we're thinking about uh, when we say we're preserving these aren't as long as the time scales museums are actually working in. I'd like to say that databases are one of the biggest frustrations, collection databases, many of them designed in the um, 80s and 90s, often pre, well, in our case, pre-internet, but with the, um, uh, they're just um, old and structured difficult databases and we have massive amounts of data in there and they just don't behave the way modern databases do and i think there's a lot of room for people to approach uh, new databases for collecting institutions um, 3d models and scans which we're very interested in we did like i said we imagined when we did this project that we'd be scanning our whole collection we haven't done that, but we have been doing some scanning. We've been doing it as part of various research projects, and we have uh, a number of 3D models. And while I think that's fantastic, I also think that here at the museum, I think I know that people are going to be scanning their collections simply because the technology is available and it clearly offers us something that we might be able to do with them. The question is what? At the moment, I feel like with our 3D models, the tendency is to put them into digital showcases, i.e. screens where people can spin them around and zoom in and out, which can be very useful. But I think there's a question about how we're going to use them within the museum in a way that um, uh, actually adds to what we are trying to do at the museum, carries forward the values of the museum. And there is a certain level of, there's an extent to which these digital technologies are tapping at the basis of some of our, or some of our primary values. They're, they're, they're causing us to question some of our values. Um, with regards to the, um, uh, modeling we're interested we've in fact we've been involved in a number of projects and a rule will speak to those where we're trying to see what we can do with those models to use them to tell stories uh, retain some level of authenticity be in some way stand in for an object but not be the object but still work the way we would like them to work and my final sort of issue and the one that I think about quite a bit, I've called it the post-digital world and, um, you know, the when I first arrived at the museum, there was a dichotomy between the analogue and the digital world and we often talked about the digital in relation to the analogue. I don't think many people would recognise what analogue technology was anymore. There's now a dichotomy between the real and the virtual, but the boundaries between the, the two are blurring. And so much of our material world now is there um, because of, the, it's there because of the digital, if it's not 3D printed or, or milled, um, there's some aspect of which it's a it's a hybrid. It's digital and it's um, and it's and it's uh, analog, if you like. And I'm wondering when you know we no longer have to refer to horses to describe our vehicles. I'm wondering when we no longer have to use digital to describe um, everything in our world, which we currently do. And um, uh, so. Um, for me, it's, um, it's something that's, uh, it's a philosophical 
question for us and it's a question about uh, it runs to where our values lie in museums so I'll um, I'm going to leave it at that and hand over to Arul who will address some of the things I've raised in his um, presentation. Thanks, thanks Matthew. Um, so I work as the digital engagement manager here and one of the um, things that I work across is our online collection. The Powerhouse collection is actually one of the earliest ones to be shared online uh, in Australia anyway. Uh, the collection was published online in 2007. Um, it's almost you know, 14, 15 years old at the moment. Um, and it consists of about 150,000 items at the moment. And this digitization project is obviously adding to that, uh, to that offering. So here are just a few numbers. Uh, we have about half a million visitors a year, um, serve up about 2 million page views. We've seen, um, we've seen all of these numbers go up in the last 12 months. Part of that is I think the effect of COVID and people being um, you know, just doing their research online a lot more than perhaps did before, but it's also the additions to the collection that we've been making out of this digitization project. Um, this is really interesting. Almost half of our visitors come from outside Australia. So uh, much of our operation is around exhibitions and, um, and around what we're putting on the floor in our galleries. But especially during the last year, um, we see the collection working really hard um, right across the world with people using it for, um, you know, for research and for learning. It's a very different um, demographic from uh, the people that use our, the visitor part of our web website. The online collection gets a different um, demographic. So some great um, you know, uplift in sessions and page views. Um, and we're doing, we're, it's an ongoing project. We're constantly looking at seeing how we can improve our collection application. And we started with this question of, um, you know, large collections have objects that are connected, but these connections often remain hidden. So how might we enable visitors to not just find the thing that they're looking for, like come in from uh, Google search and then bounce out, but discover connections to other objects within the collection? How can we show the breadth of that collection? Of course, search and browse are the two sort of modalities. Um, search is great if you know what you're looking for and you know what's on the other side of the search box, but um, if you don't, then browse is a, is a great way of sort of showing the breadth of the collection. So very quickly, we're, uh, we've made some updates to make search really simple. We've also pulled out categories. In this case, someone's looking for glass. They get um, links to vases, bowls, liquor glasses as jump off points. So there are things of related interest that you can go and explore. We still have filters and things like that if you want to get a little bit more nuanced with what you're looking for. Um, our collections have lots of things that are sets of objects or parts, um, you know, anything from a tea set to this case, Max Dupin's um, camera and accessories. So we've been doing some work on, uh, on introducing object relationships and teasing out these hierarchies. So if you came in to look at one of these objects, you can actually look at each of the, uh, each of the parts of that object and vice versa. And in some cases, you're talking about you know, a photo album with 3000 um, um, glass plate negatives, for example, or a collection. So that's a really useful way of sort of um, allowing people to see what else is in this, in this set. Um, and relationships, so we're introducing, we're prototyping a new feature, um, which is explore related objects. That's the little lozenge that you see on the right. If you click that, um, you have a view um, of all of the ways that other objects are related to the one that you're looking at via the metadata and categories, makers, years of manufacture. So in this case, you look at other cameras from that period from around the world, other photographic equipment. And if you jump to one of those objects, it'll swim to the middle of the screen. Um, and so it becomes a kind of infinite um, browsing through the collection uh, along lines of your interest. So what else might be possible? As Matthew said, we're working on a large new museum. So this, um, our collection API, uh, where is perfectly capable of being surfaced in, in large interactive um, installations as well. So kind of room scale and 
being able to work with things like gesture might be really interesting. We have been doing some work um, around 3D scanning, um, largely to see what we can do under our own steam with photogrammetry. So I'll just show you, um, this is something that our, uh, our imaging photographers were able to, um, to achieve just using existing DSLRs. Now, this will be fairly familiar to all of you, but it's, um, it's fairly new for many of us um, in the museum. So it's, it's, it was really um, great to see that that was achievable with, with the gear that we have in our studio at the moment. We have been doing some scanning um, with research partners, universities, UNSW have been working with Matt at um, Data61 as well, looking at what might be possible. We're, we, we have a lot of educational visitors, um, a lot of schools that come to visit with us. And we're really interested in what becomes possible if we can deliver our objects straight into classrooms, for example. Um, this is a project that uh, Matt from Data61 has also was sharing this panel um, and uh, worked with us on. And this was for the Microsoft HoloLens project product. We have a aircraft called the Catalina, which is a large seaplane that has a really amazing history. It went it charted a course across the South Pacific to, um, to Chile. Um, and we have in our archives amazing photographs from this journey and the plane is, hangs in our galleries. We were able to build this um, experience, a connected experience in the HoloLens platform where um, when you put it on, you see a map of the journey and the plane starts to, um, to appear and you can navigate the different points on the journey and archival photography from that journey um, starts to fill the room around you and you can explore the plane as well and learn more about its parts and history. Um, so that was, that was a great little prototype, but the challenge is really scaling something like that. This is a more recent one. This is um, something that we did um, for the anniversary of the Apollo mission. Um, we, as, you, as you'd imagine, science museums and technology museums around the world were doing things around Apollo. So objects to borrow were hard to come by, but we identified with the Smithsonian that they had an amazing data set of the interior of the Apollo module, and they were gracious enough to let us have that. So essentially we borrowed a 3D object and built uh, an exhibit around it. In this case, we took that um, 3D scan um, and um, animated it, add, added views through the window, added voice based on the actual um, you know, chatter between the astronauts and ground control um, and built an experience that made you, that allowed you to sit within Michael Collins' uh, position in the command module um, as he floated through space. Um, and I'll give you a, a little bit of a view how that work. We also, um, in the interface sense, we made it really yeah, simple. Take it easy on lunar surface. I'm going to start the uh, maneuver now. To there were things that the visitors could do, but they did it simply by using gaze as the interface and dwell time. So if you looked at that for long enough, you were able to pull the lever and that directed the rest of the experience and successful. So the key with there was to like keep it really simple uh, but accessible and um, it was a one of the most successful experiences that we put on the floor uh, we had just two units but we have we were doing about 150 sessions per day um, they had to introduce a new sort of queuing system for this experience we we're doing about uh, all in all about 20 27,000 people used it um, before COVID sort of shut it down midway. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there um, and we can, um, uh, yeah, anything else, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Matthew and Rule. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Arul and Matthew. We'll now uh, head to Megan Lawrence from the Australian Museum. Great. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Um, 
I'm from, sorry, I'm just sharing my screen so we can get to some slides and talk about the Australian Museum and the work we do there. So hopefully you can see that now. Um, so the Australian Museum is based in Sydney. We are a natural history museum and possibly have the largest collection in Australia, being the first museum in, in the country. Um, our vision is to be a leading voice for the richness of life, the earth and culture in, in Australia and the Pacific. And we're a working research institution. So our collection is a living collection. We continually work with it and conserve it and add to it. And we publish a lot of material as well. We have been for the past almost 200 years. Talking about uh, the region's environmental and social challenges, the loss of biodiversity, uh, change in climate, and our search for a cultural identity. So what do I do? I probably have the best job in the world in my mind. Um, I lead digital product development and design at the Australian Museum. Um, we have a huge uh, website redevelopment project that has effectively completed just in the past 12 months. Uh, it was a three year project that we worked on to re-platform uh, a natural history museum website, which is amazing. Um, it had over 10,000 web pages. It was huge. And we got to completely rethink how to discover all that incredible content. Um, I continually improve that with an online content strategy. So we're always publishing new materials, uh, particularly based on our vision and mission. And I also have a very small team who do digital media production, including uh, working on accessible audio guides for visitors. But we're also delivering those as an online experience. Um, we also do mobile app development. So we've done several sort of augmented reality projects um, and also citizen science projects, which I'll talk about a little bit in soon. And of course, we work with agencies to develop our on-site multimedia experiences, including some virtual reality um, projects from the past. Um, I thought I'd just quickly mention the website redevelopment. It was such a big project for us. It kicked off in 2016, where we did a really thorough uh, audience research project looking at the AM's digital ecosystem and really understanding the needs of, of the audience because it's such a big website and the analytics are pretty impressive when you see them. Um, we mapped uh, four behavioural archetypes in the end to define what their content discovery goals were and that helped inform us a new information architecture to the site. The old site had about seven or eight different menu navigation pathways and we've simplified that down to three pathways to our content um, and then mapped the 10,000 web pages for migration. We didn't publish, uh, we didn't migrate probably about 20,000 web pages. So that gives you a sense of how big the project was from the outset. And it had been initiated, the website, in that period of the internet when everyone could publish in different ways and it had a flattened URL structure. So there were a lot of challenges around this site in wrangling all the content and making sense of it for um, future discovery. Um, we also did a lot of work in user experience design and testing that and the opportunities that we had to mainly serve content in new ways. So here's a quick snapshot of the audience pathways map that we use to really help uh, explain to both our designers and developers from the outside what our opportunities were and our and our goals in sharing information about the site and also our opportunities around making sure that we were highlighting the vast amount of content in there because in the previous site structure we didn't even have breadcrumbs so you know people were landing quite deep in the site and not having a sense of all that other related content that we had on offer uh, here's another snapshot of our analytics. So we have over 5 million users in the past 12 months. And I really love looking at this site sessions um, because ours is almost inverse to most museums. And I'll, I'll get to why that's happened um, in the, from the period of March to now. Uh, the museum actually closed in uh, September 2019. So we were closed during the whole COVID period anyway. Um, and so we were working in the back end on an idea to transform our URL. So we had already migrated all our content in using the old URL. We didn't want to risk our SEO at that point. And so in June 2020, we decided it was time to switch to our new Australian.museum URL. 
and the impact was massive on our search. Um, you can see it, it pretty much halved it. It was a it was a major drop. So we had to implement uh, a sort of um, SEO recovery plan, and it took us six, three months to get back to where we used to be as far as that that challenge. But fortunately, we were closed, so we sort of got under the radar in that sense. And since we've reopened, we've gone from strength to strength as far as the visitation to the site, now that we have our planners back on the actual website. But you'll see that most of our audience are knowledge seekers. They're people looking for information about Australian animals or our minerals. We have a vast amount of um, animal fact sheets on the site. So that represents the core of our content. So what's next for us is actually an online collection discovery project. Our current online collection search is, you know, probably the worst you'll ever see if you can find it on our site. I try to bury it as much as I can. Um, and it's what Matthew was talking about. It's a very outdated uh, collection management system too. It was never built for the web and for open access. So we're currently working on a project to update the out of the box solution for our online collection search. And at the same time, use the same process that we did with the website redevelopment to really rethink what is the purpose of an online collection? What are people seeking? And really innovate around the ideas of a place-based discovery of our, of our collection, because it is very place-based in, in what we have there. So what is the collection? It's enormous. There's 21 million objects um, from natural sciences through to our First Nations cultural collection. That's a, a huge Pacific collection, as well as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander collections. And we also have a world cultures collection as well. And then we have an archives and library collection, which also includes photography, um, films, and uh, all the publications that's come out of the museum over the last 200 years. Uh, we have the type specimens of many of Australia's native birds and mammals, um, reptiles, fish, and invertebrates. So we get to tell that unique story for all the types, Matt. <laughs> Um, and we also have a huge minerals and fossils collection, as well as um, just to give that perspective of the planet. So that's why it's included in our mission. Really beautiful um, mineral collection. But only a small fraction of that is actually digitised. So we have a huge challenge, 21 million objects to digitise. And they all have these lovely little handwritten labels, which is sometimes really difficult to decipher. So the museum initiated an, a volunteer-based digitization program called Digivol. Um, it's been going for almost 10 years, I believe, and it's pretty successful in the volumes that they actually get through. We have volunteers come on site in a specially built lab and they photograph the object with the label, and then it's uploaded to the Digivol platform, which is run by the Atlas of Living Australia, and that sort of aggregates lots of the collections from across the country. Um, and our online volunteers will transcribe those labels for us. And there's lots of different projects that are actually part of the Digivol platform. We have field journals, you know, lots of people contributed to it. And it's actually an international program too. So if you love data, um, data entry, this is the best place for you. But we've also started our own collection enhancement project, which is an on-site um, digitization program. Uh, over the next 10 years, and that's exciting for us too. And it does include the lovely photogrammetry, so I'm very interested in Pedro's work. Um, we've been looking at digitising some of our fossil collections. The fossils in uh, Canounja are just incredible. They're huge slabs of fossils, and so they've been digitised, and some of those are now accessible. I've included the URL there if you want to jump in and have a look at them later. Um, but we are still at that point of what, how are we going to embed all this amazing rich data across our website and really link it through to our um, fact sheets and our information and once again make the collection living and real to our users. Finally, I just wanted to touch base on some of our citizen science projects. Uh, Frog ID is one of our most successful national citizen science projects and it's also born digital data collection, which is really exciting for us. Uh, it's all about recording frog calls and, you know, the uptake has been phenomenal. In fact, it's it's almost a victim of its own success because we always have a huge backlog of these frog calls to validate. Um, frogs actually all have unique calls based on their species. Sometimes you can't tell them apart, so a photo isn't particularly helpful for us. 
But if you record their call and submit it through the app, our experts can then validate what that frog is. And it's a pretty incredible um, opportunity for us not to be having to go out there to actually collect this information ourselves. So you can see over the last past few years, we've had over 200,000 frogs identified across Australia, which is amazing. And this directly informs conservation strategies. And we make the data open so local government areas can get in there and see where their frog hotspots are. Um, you can browse by frog species. And we've just gotten over 202 of the 214 species in Australia. So it's a really incredibly uh, successful project that we're very proud of and takes a lot of our effort. Um, we also made sure we had a partnership um, to help deliver the technical side of it. So we work with IBM, but we also have our own developers working on a lot of the seamless work of that too. So there's lots of other projects I could talk about, but I'll leave it for now and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, next we have Amanda Dennett from the Australian War Memorial. Hello. Um, thanks very much for having me. So my name is Amanda. I'm the head of digital experience at the Australian War Memorial, responsible for um, all of the memorials, um, website delivery, um, intranet as well, and some staff um, digital solutions, um, the memorial's social media presence, as well as the delivery of digital projects like virtual reality experiences. Um, so I'll just do my screen share. So hopefully you can see that okay. Um, so essentially the core drivers for the memorial in focusing on digital are reaching larger audiences. So we're based in Canberra, um, the capital of Australia, and we get around 1 million on-site visitors per year um, when we're not in COVID times. Um, and we know that if we were based in Sydney or Melbourne, where there are a lot more tourists and a lot more people that we might be able to access larger um, visitor pools in person. So we have quite a big focus on using digital experiences to engage audiences that might not be able to come to Canberra. And that includes a lot of schools audiences as well. So a lot of the materials that we deliver um, online form part of the Australian curriculum. And so students um, have to learn about those at school. So on average, we reach uh, an audience that's six times six times larger each year than the audience that we would reach um, in person that's able to visit the memorial. So uh, at its core, the memorial is the centre of commemorations for Australia, and we commemorate the service of um, men and women who fought um, from colonial wars through to the First and Second World War. Um, and also recently, we've had more of a focus on recent conflicts, so um, post um, 1945, um, Vietnam, Korea, um, through to Afghanistan and um, peacekeeping operations that are continuing today. So I wanted to go through just really quickly a couple of the examples that we have of delivering immersive experiences to try to take our collection to people in a different way and particularly to encourage younger people to engage with our content. Um, because of the type of content that we deliver, our audience often skews older and so our key visitor of our audiences on site are um, often people over 55 or school aged children. So we wanted to reach younger um, adults, perhaps um, people sort of in their 30s or 40s with younger children who um, might become repeat visitors to the memorial. So one of the ways that we've tried to reach new audiences is through our On Closer Inspection series where we delivered five interactive experiences of large technology objects. So we've got um, the Bushmaster, protected mobility vehicle, a tank from the First World War, um, an Adelaide class ship. So things that you can't um, necessarily come and see at the memorial. Um, and so we've taken them online to make them interactive. So this is an example from um, our launch of the most recent experience, G for George. Um, so I've got the aircraft in the background and on the screen there you can see 
our delivery where we've put it in a warehouse. You can fully rotate the, um, the aircraft and then click on the um, icons around it to see um, embedded items from our collection. So whether it's um, video content or an oral history, um, we've, we've tried to display multiple collection items within the context um, of that object to bring a, a museum experience at home. One of the challenges that this presented was um, the ability to capture um, a, a massive aircraft um, in a, uh, a realistic way for online audiences. And so um, some of the speakers already have described, um, you know, photogrammetry and other ma uh, methods of capture, which we've used for a number of projects. But for this one, we um, also looked at um, making scale models and, um, and photographing those um, simply because um, the scale wasn't possible for us to, ch to achieve um, within the time frame we had to do it. And also, um, you know, we looked at purchasing digital models and adapting those ourselves. So um, it was quite a different approach for us, this project, and it presented some challenges for our team. The next project I wanted to highlight is um, the Battle of Hamel virtual reality experience where we tried to take that immersive experience um, and deliver it at scale in the museum. So we delivered this in 2018 for the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Hamel. And we had uh, 50 people at a time in the audience um, and we delivered five sessions a day and um, it was really quite exciting to deliver because we would bring everyone in together, put their headsets on, and um, they would begin this experience. So you can see at the bottom of the screen, um, we used a style that um, mimicked paintings from the First World War that were done um, by official war artists at the time, so that it wasn't too um, scary of a battle scene for younger people that would wanna visit the experience. And the most exciting part was midway through the experience people were given a choice point um, what role will you choose and then they could progress as a soldier a pilot or a member of the tank crew and during the display that had real excitement and chatter from people because they knew that everyone around them might be choosing something different and then afterwards as they left you could hear people have a discussion about you know what did you choose and what did you see and it created that kind of ongoing discussion about the experience that, that we were hoping um, to achieve with a larger group of people. Um, so 3D collections has been touched on a bit already. We've launched a project 3D treasures and I'm sorry for some of the image quality, but um, my internet wasn't great enough to show you live, but um, we've delivered 25 3D objects online and we've got another 25 to launch um, by the 30th of June, 2021. And we've tried to represent a series of objects from across a range of conflicts. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we've got to focus on more recent conflicts. So this is an example of a Black Hawk um, engine cowling, which is um, an item in our collection from um, Afghanistan. And so we were able to represent, you know, both the front and the back of the cowling, which was used to, um, once the aircraft had crashed, it was used to um, transport wounded, um, wounded soldiers um, by others. And um, so it's something that, yeah, really means a lot to the veterans involved. And I've got an image there from our launch where it was really nice to welcome back um, the veteran and his wife, um, to see the display in, in person, but also to see how their story was gonna be taken to more audiences online. Um, and so for Mark and Renee, that was a really, um, yeah, a really kind of powerful morning. And it, and it was a nice reminder actually about um, the power of digital collections and what they can mean to the people whose stories they tell. With, uh, I, with 3D Treasures, an ongoing challenge for us and that we're tackling next is how we can best integrate these 3D objects into our broader collection display and search online. Um, and at the moment, our collection display is quite traditional. We've got uh, flat images of items from the collection. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're working now on how we can embed this so that you can see the, um, the photograph of an object, related items, as well as the 3D collection item, um, all within the context of one, one another to get a full picture. And so that's, um, but that's presenting a few challenges for us. 
One project that's a little bit different that I thought I could highlight um, in terms of research opportunities is Places of Pride, which um, is a, a crowdsource website that we're using to map the location of every single war memorial across Australia. So uh, just back in November, we hit the milestone of 10,000 memorials. So they are the small um, honour boards, cenotaphs and um, memorials that feature in every small town that have the names of Australians who have um, served in wars and or who died in war um, as a way to remember their service. And uh, a national register did not exist and so we created one. Um, but crowdsourcing photographs and locations has proved quite difficult. Um, there's issues related to copyright of images um, and how we can best represent those when they vary in quality. And so uh, I thought I'd mention that as an interesting sort of research challenge um, for um, participants today, but also just as something that we're tackling on an ongoing basis now. And then finally, I thought I would finish with uh, an example of a research project that we delivered uh, in the last couple of years, along with Data61 at CSIRO. So we set ourselves the challenge of looking at um, the concept of remembrance and the feelings that people had um, and expressed in the social media posts that they shared about the centenary of armistice. So that is the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. And we encouraged social media sharing through our channels, um, through the Memorials website. And uh, we were able to collect um, and analyze uh, 5,112 posts over a five week period. So not all, not all posts were, were sort of in scope, but um, we then mapped using natural language processing, we mapped the words used within those posts to a set of emotions that we had predetermined. Um, and that we knew would uh, were regularly mentioned in social media messages after some pre-analysis. So they were the emotions of respect, gratitude, humility, pride, sadness, and discontent. Um, and then what we decided to do was uh, represent that live on, on our website and also uh, on big screens in the grounds of the memorial um, during during the five week sort of display for the end for the, that centenary period. Um, and so we use that, that representation of a poppy. So each of the colors would become brighter or darker depending on which emotion was the dominant one at any, at any given period of time during that five weeks. And so it became quite a powerful way to understand how people were commemorating personally and using social media to commemorate. Um, and to try to display that in a way that schools and broader audiences could understand. So that, that project had its own um, challenges as well, but it was really interesting to take um, social media statements, um, you know, lest we forget and thanks for your service and look at what that might mean to the people that were posting them. And so there's plenty more work to build on there, but I thought that might be of interest to this group. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks. Um, our uh, final introduction is from Kate Carruthers uh, from the University of New South Wales. I'm muting myself. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I don't have slides. Uh, <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm really fascinated by all of these things. I'll be talking to Pedro later to think that's a really interesting uh, solution there. A as a university, we've got a slightly different problem and a slightly different scope to, to the uh, other institutions that have spoken here. So we have a, a really broad scale of collections and a lot of them weren't collected with the idea to share them. Uh, so we've got the things that Matt talked about right in the beginning. Uh, we've got all these samples, animal, vegetable, mineral, all of the above. Um, and for, for our library, who are our main custodians of collections in, in our historical sense, as an organisation, they're really focused on getting our print artefacts digitised. And that's a big focus for them. Uh, but we also have uh, art collections. We've got you know, with paintings and sculptures and other kinds of artifacts. And that includes a lot of indigenous 
works. Uh, we've got a lot of rare books which are in the process of being digitized. Um, we've even got our own museum. We've got a museum of, of human disease, which has all these fabulous uh, artifacts from like bits of people's bodies that have been preserved and stuff. And it's been really interesting with COVID how we've tried to, like all the other institutions, try to contemplate how can we make these available to people even when they can't come to us. Uh, so there's all of that side of it. Um, and we collected a lot of these things in the course of our research, in the course of what we do as, as our business, which is actually research and teaching. Uh, and we didn't really think that we might want to share them with people in the future. So we need to start to think about how we can approach that differently and also how we can classify our collections, classify the data in our collections so that we can work out what we're allowed to share with people, you know, through either open data initiatives and things. And that's a big initiative for us. And, um, and we, we, so a big thing for us is we, we need to understand the provenance of, of our collections and we need to be clear about our rights in respect of them and other people's rights in respect of them. So that's something that we're working on now. And that's kind of a joint thing between the research division, the actual researchers and, and the library. Uh, so it's very much a team effort. And one of the things that we're really focused on is how can we manage the metadata? So the data about our collections so that we can uh, understand what we are, are able to share and how we can do that. And I think a number of people have alluded to the issue of, of the technology that we use to do this, the databases, uh, which I implemented uh, one for a gallery a number of years ago that was on MS-DOS, you know, and I reckon a whole lot of institutions are still using that tool. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. So how do we, big, big challenge for me is how do we do it at scale? Because we've got really heaps of collections. Um, and how do, how do we do it so that we can share digital images? And how can we start to amalgamate things like artificial intelligence, um, machine learning, uh, AR and VR into it so that we can make it accessible to people so that, that it can be accessible uh, from remote locations and also how do we make things interactive and I think everybody's touched on a bit of the puzzle that we're all working on and it's really relevant for GLAM because uh, it, it is an area where you know it's something that we do want to share it's the very nature of it is we want to share it uh, so I think there are real challenges ahead for us, but I think the technology is there. The real challenge for most organisations is going to be cost, because increasingly we're not able to store all of this on premise in our own databases and things. And I think we're going to need to look at common solutions and to develop some sort of digital commons for the sector would be a really interesting thing to explore, I suspect. Uh, so, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. So we'll shift into a bit of uh, some questions and a bit of discussion now. Um, and uh, actually, I'm going to kick off, if that's all right, with Kate, who was just talking. Um, and uh, and I want to ask about as as museums and shift uh, museums and universities shift more to delivering things online. Uh, the context shifts away from the, the historic campuses and buildings um, and they, um, the institutions start to need to compete with the rest of the web uh, for their authority or for their um, uh, credentials to some degree. Um, what can these organizations start to do to help people navigate what is fake or fabricated and, and what's not? I mean, a lot of it is just the fact that we exist as institutions and we have the gravitas that comes with having a real world presence. But increasingly, we're going to need to be able to validate that the digital experience that you're getting from one of us is really us. And I, I suspect that blockchain will play a big part in that. And there's already some early sort of moves in that space uh, with NFTs. Um, so I think 
I think that that is one of the real world applications for blockchain uh, in, in the not too distant future. Cool. Uh, and I won't follow that up by asking Amanda, um, are there particular ways that the War Memorial deals with uh, fake or contested um, uh, truths? Yeah, it's, it, it is a real challenge. Um, and we probably tackle it in a few ways. Um, from the traditional, you know, um, approaches that we might get over phone or email from family members who are certain that it's a, it's a, a member of their family that's in a photograph. Um, and they're, they're just absolutely certain that that, that is them from a certain time. Um, yet we've got records that show that they weren't in the country at that time, it's no way it could be them, um, but they've got a family narrative that that sort of might have been built around um, that person serving uh, at a key moment in history. And so, those discussions that are quite personal through to broad um, representations of um, facts and things that have happened in our history um, can be really challenging, particularly when they are um, personal to people. Uh, I think building on what Kate said, it is very much. Um, presenting ourselves as um, the key and, and leading institutions for the knowledge that we kind of hold and, on behalf of, um, we're sort of custodians for on behalf of um, Australia, really, in the case of the Australian War Memorial. And so I guess it comes to the, the veracity of our content, making sure that it is accurate um, and that where we create a representation. Um, perhaps we might use a model as I described earlier that we're really clear with people um, when something is real or when it has been created in order for them to have an experience. Um, and that by being transparent, we, um, yeah, we build that trust. Uh, and we do that on display on site here. If we have to display a facsimile, which isn't our preference, you know, we let people know about that. So I think it has to come back to um, us telling truths as well as, um, uh, you know, as as others, so that we can, um, I guess, people can trust what we're putting out there. Um, next thing I want to touch on is related to that, um, and I'm going to ask Matthew about. Um, uh, well, f physical objects are are often held in specific institutions, and we've just been talking about those institutions having a certain amount of. Uh, credibility, but history doesn't usually align with such boundaries. And uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how you convey stories that link objects between institutions and um, uh, what types of uh, distributed information retrieval might be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Amanda. So I mean, traditionally, when we do an exhibition and we want to um, include material that we don't have, and I have to say, we would really do an exhibition here without borrowing something from somewhere that fits into the story that we're trying to tell. Um, and so we borrow from another institution. <clears throat> when we're now coming up against this now where we have stories to tell for, for experiences that are likely to be digital experiences and also just an extension of our own um, our own research, really, when we, we want to look for items or we want to understand a field and we want to understand what material culture exists in relation to a story or a field or a theme. We want to look at what's available, um, you know, across, across the country, across the world. And at the moment, it means doing the work on your own database and then logging into, into another database and then logging into yet another database. And with museums, you're going through the online system, which may or may not get to everything. And so uh, there have been many times, um, and just in relation to our own research, where we would like to better explore um, <clears throat> artefacts that relate to a particular topic and we realise that a lot of them are, uh, are elsewhere and the desire to create a distributed database so that everybody who was interested in the topic could get access to it uh, from the one place, you know, it's, uh, it's a strong desire. Um, I don't know 
uh, how to how to achieve that. But um, I know it goes back to what I was saying about I think the traditional collection databases are um, very proprietary, very difficult to search. Um, you know, when we I don't have to be able to spell anything anymore. I just have a sort of half a go in Google and let it do the work. If I try to do that on our current database, um, you know, I have to get it exactly right or I'm not going to find anything. Um, in fact, I was looking for the Apple One computer, which is one of our favourite objects in our collection. And when it was entered in by the curator, he used a capital I instead of a one. And so one of our best objects is lost to the world through the web and to the curators using using emu so um i would love to see some capacity to search across databases and to connect databases and you know i don't know what you've got at data 61 there matt but um you or anybody else, if if we had a way of interrogating across databases, I guess it would mean doing creating some sort of standards across perhaps a new generation of databases. I say, please go to it. Including 3D, yeah. yeah. I think you're on mute, Matt, sorry. Thank you. I'll flip to uh, Pedro next and and ask if he can comment on some of the the alternative ways of describing objects that aren't uh, just text based um you know what sort of metadata semantic markup standards yeah. are possible for 3d objects yeah, exactly so uh, actually what i showed in the slides was the technology to actually get to the 3d models but we are well aware that this is just the beginning of the challenge so to say because once you're able to scan entire collections, large collections on a massive scale, then the curators will have the issues to actually annotate the data and also then find data and do all sorts of things. So we came up with ideas to actually have data enriched data, which means that, for instance, for the three models that we generate, we also store similarity gradients. So to be able to look for geometrically similar objects or segments of those objects would also be possible. And we're trying to extend this through additional projects that we hopefully get uh, to, to, for instance, material properties, to texture parts, to whatever you can find as attributes of the 3D models to generate comparators that you could then send to legacy databases to peruse them and then search for correlated data, which might then also be correlated to the object you want to annotate right now. Right, so this would be the idea to actually come up with a sort of automation that would give curators kind of an expectation results list that they would have to just uh, basically say if that's correct or not the correlation that was found automatically based on those comparators from different attributes that you can extract from the 3D models. And of course, right now we're working on geometry and color, but we also plan to go multispectral. The long-term goal is to go for consolidated 3D models, which will not only merge and fuse the results <clears throat> of surface scans, but also CT scans, MRI, mass spectroscopy, ultrasound, whatever you can get on an object to really create a digital twin and then actually use those uh, comparators to actually do automatic analysis comparison to our other objects in, in other databases and then ease the pain of actually annotating and scientifically work with them. And the, the other uh, part of what we are focusing on is to go towards web-centered 3D, uh, sorry, web-based 3D-centered annotation systems. So because we don't only want the objects to turn nicely on a web page, but the idea should be to actually be able to work with them and to actually transfer the analog tools to the digital world and then have an archaeologist uh, compare an object with another one, measure them, have a kinematic simulation if some bones will actually fit other bones and things like that. So this is what we envisage for the future uh, to go for that sort of thing. So uh, just taking with you for a moment, Pedro, uh, what what represents the most challenging objects for scanning right now um and and what do you think in terms of acquisition uh researchers need to address next 
Well, <clears throat> the one thing is that we, we saw that there are no standards for 3D. There are some standards to actually calculate or measure the precision of a scanning system, but there are no standards for color in 3D. We, we try to adapt the ones from 2D, but we also know that this might not yet be physically correct, absolutely correct. And so the next step would be to go multispectral to eventually get around color charts. So to have the, the capture of the discrete spectrum of light. And then also uh, what I showed to you already is, is very automated and very nice and works for a lot of, lots of materials. And we can also tackle shiny surfaces now without having to spray surfaces, but we still have issues with translucent objects, for instance. <clears throat> Semi-translucency, we're starting to tackle it a little bit, but for instance, glass objects or jewels uh, with highly different reflection patterns, this is all very difficult to capture right now. And the idea is actually to minimize this gap of the objects that we cannot yet capture. And, and that's basically the way we're going. So it's like multispectral, maybe combined with other sensors that help us uh, also uh, grab uh, maybe translucent objects, maybe combine it with ultrasound with other technologies to see if we get there and, and can actually capture it all and every object. Also, there are very complex geometries, like if you have very sharp edges, uh, this will be a problem for photogrammetry. And so in those cases, you might still need some manual post-processing, but the idea is to keep manual work at bay if possible. So, uh, so you can actually scan entire collections at, at, a, at an economic way, in an economic way. So uh, on that topic, I'm gonna go to a rule next and uh, ask for, um, uh, for you to comment on where the biggest bottlenecks are in uh, acquiring imagery of uh, physical objects. Um, you know, is it staff time? Is it technology? Is it um, uh, something else? Uh, yeah. What's, the, um, what, what's the, the biggest model next and how do you prioritize? Yeah, so I think it's, um, it starts even before that. I think it's, it has to do with what Matthew was alluding to in terms of um, the maturity of the technology and um, and how we as an institution come to a decision to put a lot of resource into something that's potentially still evolving quite a lot. And so there aren't really standards on it. We don't want to be in that point where we've you know, pulled out the first digital camera and taken pictures of everything in the collection. And then you know, six months later, they're, um, they're obviously um, not adequate for what we want to do. Um, so that, that's one. When do we scan it? We did um, try that. Yeah. Um, how to scan and a lot of you know, what Pedro has been talking about uh, is fascinating to me. Um, how do we do that at scale? Um, and how do we store it? So we, we have that ancient you know, collection management system that, was, uh, that is performing moves that it was never anticipated to do, um, but it's text-based. It can barely kind of hold um, other media types at the moment. So where would you put, uh, you know, a large poly model and textures and um, store it and for make it searchable. Um, so that's sort of a, an asset management system that can actually do that would be an important thing. Um, and lastly, how do we how do we present it? Um, what's that layer like and how do, how do we make that standardized enough that anyone can access it through our online collection website? Those are some of the things I think that we're that we're kind of thinking through. So what we're doing is just doing it on a case by case basis where there is a particular project where we see an immediate use for it or a set of objects that you know a school is super interested in. We can make that investment um, and learn from that and, and and see at what scale we want, what stage we want to go, much higher with the scale of it. Um, but while I go to there, uh, we've got a. a question that's come in uh, around um, uh, at the other end of things that uh, the, um, the access um, by uh, the community um, and we're asked here if uh, if the high-tech machine learning complex analysis uh, you know um, uh, all the the um, the biggest and the best things that we can possibly do, um, whether that's actually compatible with wide and inclusive pu public access. Um, you know, do how do you figure out what um, 
what the uh, level of uh, the community's access to to computing is and uh, try and match that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really good question. Um, you can do it through research in some cases, and we do that, um, especially with the online collection. Um, but we, we're also looking at the technology that is commonplace, things like phones as, as uh, ways to access that information. And you know, we've got all of this information in a collection database. We've got people walking through the museum, but we don't often connect the two. So what's what's the glue that makes that possible, right? Let's that idea of a sort of Shazam for objects, but um, does it just bring up just the label information that we've always had, or is there a way of presenting much more than that? You know, could you actually look at how something that's sort of just a frozen um, engine, like how, what did it look like when it was in motion? So what could we deliver that's more than what the humble and very hardworking label does. Um, that's what we're thinking. But the base level, I think smartphones give us uh, um, something that's quite accessible. Um, obviously, something like the HoloLens is a whole different ballpark. And that's where we, we found it hard to build anything that would scale beyond five or six um, participants. So yeah, the technology that people already have, I think is, is where we're going to aim it. I um, would add to that um, just, just briefly um, just briefly to say that I guess a few people have mentioned tonight about the volume of our collections and just how much of it we can digitise. Um, and it's certainly, you know, the case for us and I'm sure for, for others that, you know, it is impossible to put on display, you know, anywhere near um, a large enough pr proportion of, um, of our collections for public access. And so that's why we make collections available online. Um, and I do think that there's value, you know, we, we collect not only for um, public access, but for preservation and for, um, you know, I guess painting that, that um, historical picture over time. And so it certainly is valid for us to kind of push some of those boundaries on how we can use technologies in order to, to capture snapshots of um, objects and stories over time, um, even as those formats change. And so some of the things that we're thinking about um, in relation to that, uh, that at the point of capture that we, we try to, um, to do that at you know, various resolutions, for example, so that you've got um, kind of the, the lower end that is easy for people to access as well as those kind of preservation standard um, images perhaps and then also we're thinking about it in the delivery so some of the examples that I showed in my presentation of um, the on closer inspection series you know we've deployed that um, on our website as a kind of react um, 360 experience that you can engage with um, on your website or mobile phone um, we've got a VR um, headset deployed version that's like React um, VR that's kind of higher higher end. And then we've gone for a, a YouTube 360 kind of basic version that um, is much more of a guided experience so that literally anyone with an internet connection can look at it. So I think there's a few ways that, um, that museums are thinking about the user and how they can access the stuff that we're creating. Thank you. Um, we've got another question that's come in here and I'll uh, ask Megan first and then open it up more broadly as well. But um, I, We've touched a little bit on this already, but um, the question here is interested in how are institutions navigating ethical considerations around sharing objects? So the Australian Museum I know has a, a large indigenous collection, um, but there's, a, there's other considerations around uh, um, legal um, and ownership and those sorts of things. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And also just touching on um, the opportunities of AI, I think with image recognition is really helpful for us in identification and collection and growing collections. I just wanted to throw that in there. Um, but yeah, uh, um, Indigenous knowledge IP is incredibly important to consider before we open up these collections. And we are putting a lot of um, thought into how we can do digital repatriation back to uh, community as well. So that we're sharing with the right people, they've got access to their collection objects from their community. 
um, but it's still being held within the museum as a you know um, as the trustee of that collection, I guess. So um, it, it's a it's a really big issue for us, and I think around image management was where I first kind of engaged with it because the scientific community are really into open collections. You know, they share their research, they share their images, they're into Creative Commons, where there's a lot of other complexity around First Nation cultural collections and that knowledge IP that I was just mentioning. So it's an ongoing um, requirement for us and it, you're sort of constantly balancing the two needs um, for openness, but also for making sure that um, uh, there's the respect and, and the awareness of the collections as well. Um, and once again, just the access to the information that's hold, held in a collection management system isn't necessarily recommended for the everyday public user. So that's why we always go back to what is that user looking for and then we can meet their needs rather than just serving them what we have, you know, um, and because it, it's not really helpful in meeting their requirements anyway. Hope that kind of answers it. <laughs> and and broadly speaking, do, would any of you like to comment on um, any particular characteristics of the um, the tasks or the, um, the types of people who are conducting searches or you know the um, coming to your websites or people typically just coming from Google. For us, it's mainly Google obviously landing deep into the site, but from the collection perspective, as I said, our collection is largely hidden. People don't really have a sense of what's there. And, you know, there's so many issues around it too, because it's a natural sciences collection. And when you ask Pedro any challenges around objects, you know, we have wet collections, we have objects in jars, we have, you know, jars of insects and things like that. So how do we digitize those? But also who really wants to access that? Um, but we also have DNA collections too and frozen tissue collections. So they are actually probably more interesting as far as sharing for research and resources. And I do think about what Matthew said too, which is about curatorial requirements so that people can get in there if they're curating and create their own sets online too. I think there's a lot of excitement for us to start thinking about the online exhibition component of being able to see other people's collections and then aggregate them together in interesting ways. Um, particularly when you think about, you know, rare books and we have the specimens and then we have the research, we can make all those really interesting connections and present them together. Yeah, we, um, yeah, Google's a big part of it, but um, also uh, there are lots of people in educational institutions that link to us or reference materials. Um, and so we see lots of repeat traffics to, you know, odd items. Um, Reddit, oddly enough, is also very spiky, but every now and then um, we get a lot of traffic from Reddit. We have an amazing um, set of black and white photography from you know, early Australia, um, the entire collections that were acquired to us. And those are online and they're, um, they're being re colored by the this massive you know colorization community on reddit um, and so they're they're working through all of these images painstakingly hand color i mean like coloring them um, pinterest is fairly big too especially with the design collection that we hold and things like you know wallpapers and um, and um, uh, and uh, design artifacts so it's quite a bit from that and um yeah. Can I also say there's a lot of, because our um, online database is harvested from our actual collection information system, it's, and it's a lot easier to use and a lot quicker, a lot of staff use it in preference to using the database because it answers a lot of questions very quickly and you don't have to wade through the interface that is um, uh, the online system. So, um, and particularly when we were all working at home and trying to access the uh, database um, through a VPN, um, it was just easier to go to the web. And so, you know, we're all in the habit of using our own website collection search as a first port of call because it delivers a lot of quick answers quickly. We've got, um, I think, similar um, uh, 
similar experiences to what um, Megan, Arul and Matthew have, have described. Um, but one additional one for us that might be of interest is um, family history researchers um, and just broader sort of history researchers in general that um, will often have to go from um, the Australian War Memorial website over to the National Archives of Australia because we hold um, different records that help piece together the picture of a person so they're very much interlinked in terms of trying to explore when someone um, you know left Australia to um, head to Gallipoli and when they enlisted and when they came home and so um, we've been talking with the National Archives about how we can um, have better linkages between our, our two collections in that area but um, yeah that's that's a challenge for us because it's time consuming work for, for both of our organisations but it would have a real impact on the people that are trying to search across those collections to get a picture of, um, of certain people who've served. Um, look, we've, uh, we've covered a lot of ground and uh, sort of brought us to a final question, which I'm going to go around to each of you to get your brief thoughts on. Um, and uh, I'll, um, I'll roughly go left to right on my screen. I'm not sure if it's the same on everybody's, but the um, uh, question is, if we could time travel 25 to 30 years in the future, what do you think uh, we might find most surprising about the way people are engaging with uh, engaging digitally with with cultural heritage and, and educational collections? Uh, so I'm going to start off with Kate. Hmm. Uh, on mute, I think. Put me on putting go. me on the spot. Um, I, I think I think we're going to be. Uh, engaging in 3D in real life uh, with digital collections. So, you know, uh, I, I kind of think the, the future is being a combination of Star Wars and Star Trek, you know, uh, that's what I think the future is going to be. Uh, next is a rule. Um, look, I think, you know, COVID gave us a little bit of a window into that, um, in that lots of museums are scrambling to open access, put things online. Um, and it was, a lot of it was interesting. A lot of it was, I, I can't walk through another virtual gallery, um, you know, uh, that isn't doing anything more than trying to replicate that experience in a different platform. So I think that will mature. I think we'll actually find more useful things to do with these 3D assets. I think it'll be much more connected. I think all of us museums like us will have a global offering as well as a local offering and both of those will be um, as important as the other. Uh, Amanda? Um, yeah, look, I think it's really interesting um, but I am really sort of passionate about the, I guess, the partnership between like the physical objects themselves and the on-site museum experience and then what the digital element brings to lot to kind of wider audiences but that sense of being able to kind of see and touch something is really important to people um, in terms of remembrance and and learning and so yeah I'm quite interested in um, 3D objects and engaging with them kind of in person whether it's through VR and potentially through AR but also the role that 3D printing um, and future evolutions of that might play for um, classrooms. So we've got a program at the Memorial that's a lo-fi version of that where you can um, order a memorial box and we will send you artifacts to a classroom that kids can touch and play with. But you know, why, why kind of ship that when, um, you know, from our websites, um, you know, teachers can plan a lesson and print objects from our collection that help tell their stories. So I think um, personalised um, 3D experiences are um, something that I'd like to see. Great. Um, Megan, uh, what do you think we'll be finding surprising in 25 to 30 yeah, years time? I love Amanda's answer because I was very similar, but I, I'm a big diorama fan as well. So I love the digital diorama. And sadly, so many of our species are under threat um, of extinction in 25 years, you know, with climate change, you know, 
the only way we're going to experience a lot of these animals and, and species in the future will be through a digital diorama. So it's a bit of a bummer, but I think we also have the technology to try to change things and really um, rally our, our leaders to start you know, accepting the reality of climate change so that that isn't a real reality. Uh, Pedro. Oh, much has been said already. And I would go back to what I said before that I hope that we have something like consolidated 3D models that people can actually start working with the 3D models instead of just looking at them. Uh, 3D printing is coming. We have a partner department that is working on color faithful reproductions. Uh, so hopefully prices will drop as well for all those technologies to make them more accessible for everybody. But I look forward to actually be able to work in 3D with the analog tools that you had and be able to leave the originals as much as possible alone because most of them, many times they are fragile. And in this way, you could have concurrent research. You could have concurrent experiences all over the world and have a stronger connection uh, between places. And thank you. And Matthew. Um, uh, 20 to 30 years, I imagine it would be a bit of a joke to be talking about the, the digital world as separate to anything else. And I imagine that there would be seamless integration between our digital tools and the rest of the world. You know, an example for me would be Google Maps, where we do, without thinking, move between the real world and its virtual representation um, without having to sort of uh, examine what we're doing. So it becomes um, no representation in our mind of the two separate worlds. And I'm, I expect that, that that will be the case. Um, then either that or we'll all be living on boats wearing tatty clothes and there won't be any technology. There'll be no computers at all. Marvellous. Um, well, I would like to, uh, on behalf of everyone watching now and uh, um, everyone watching the recording in the future, um, I'd like to thank uh, Amanda, Arul, Kate, Matthew, Megan and Pedro for a great panel. Um, it's been really interesting to uh, have this uh, introduction to this set of problems and, and the solutions. Um, uh, which, uh, which are relevant to everyone. Um, and, uh, but uh, perhaps a little underexplored by the research community. And I hope that uh, um, this has uh, inspired a number of, number of us to think more broadly. And uh, I, I'd like to be seeing some, um, some papers presented at next year's conference addressing some of these issues. Um, and with that, I'll uh, wish everyone a great rest of the conference. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. See you guys.